So I guess you can start by telling us, um, you know, we were talking about the Sindel studio and that was the first gallery. Um, and then at a certain point... Um, yeah, and obviously at the, there was a photograph of Shirley Berman City uh, at the Sindel uh, during Artie Richards' exhibition, which clearly meant that some of the people in our circle had started to see themselves as artists in the sense of exhibiting and being part of that art world, which was a big change because up until a certain point, no one conceived. Everyone was so far outside the system that we didn't conceive of that of our being possibly part of that or wanting to be. And I think uh, Walter, because he was very congenial, coming from that that world of wanting to exhibit and being part of traditional art uh, was an introduction and a lure to move people into showing their work and getting both the benefits and the the dangers of that that, that exposure. And so then we moved on and there's and yes, and these are pictures at the uh, Ferris Gallery, which uh, Walter and Ed Keynotes were running. And that was like marked a real sort of dividing line in who went where, because Wally Berman had been had resist had just not thought of the uh, of exhibiting, and he had gradually been persuaded by Walter that this was a this would be a congenial space, and he was producing enough art that was hard to exhibit and to share, so that he did finally have a beautiful exhibition, which led to his being arrested and being. Uh, very painfully exposed to the reality of the, you know, a mini police state, and uh, and also a really a disgraceful uh, handling of his case by the gallery. Walter and Ed, you know, really betrayed him when it came to like defending the case, uh, and it alienated him enormously from exhibiting, and he never exhibited again. He, in fact, he he left town as part of his alienation. That was a very painful shock. Both for it to happen, and I think he had, he had to realize that he had been taken advantage of. However, consciously by Walter and Ed, uh, it was a very painful experience for him. And that confirmed a number of people's feeling about the art world that it wasn't to be trusted. And then, of course, the gallery became very commercialized when Irving Blum came along, and there was a, then a complete division among, among the artists, the artists who were like careerists which is legitimate, but there's a personality that goes with uh, an artist that is, has chosen to exist for the marketplace as well as their own personal vision and people who were alienated and repelled by that. And so there was a real split in terms of people who were less apt to, hope to deal with the, with the conventional art world just from the experience of watching what had happened to uh, Wally. And we noticed that Irving Blum when he took over the Ferris, dropped a number of artists that previously had been part of one nice, big, familial art community. He dropped them because they weren't commercial enough. And he exactly, he dropped, uh, he's, he's very open and admitting because he was running a business and an enormously su successful business, as we know. That's right. So do you think you could go through some of these prints and mm -hmm. yes, this is. tell us a little bit about them? <laughs> This is so strange. This is the day of Wally's arrest, and the, and the plainclothes <laughs> detectives are escorting Wally to the police car, and he stops to crank this mobile sculpture. Wally stops to crank this mobile sculpture in a, in a spirit of lightheartedness, and Artie Richer is grinning, and Bob Alexander has a beer and is smiling. Uh, David Meltzer looks a little perturbed as we all were, but pretending not to be. Uh, and the art, <laughs> the detectives who'd probably never been in an art gallery before didn't quite understand what kind of a crime <laughs> and what kind of a criminal they were escorting to the police. And did you have word that something was going down? I mean, is that why everybody was there at that point? Uh, that, okay, that is, that is, th that, that is a whole story. Oh. And we went, we did go through that, so. Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, and, and to me, this is one of the, one of these stories that I have been trying to get clear in my own mind and trying to uh, 
it, the whole Ferris Gallery with, and Wally Berman tragedy, I think of a tragedy, was uh, what happened? As we understood it, there was the police received a complaint, an anonymous complaint, that there was something pornographic at this art gallery. My best suspic suspicion is that either Ed Keenholz or Walter Hopps made that call in order to create some publicity. Uh, though their later handling of the case is such that they didn't know what they were doing because they didn't know how to exploit it. Wally, I think, was a total victim in this case. The, we knew some, we knew the day they, the police were going to come. I don't know how we knew. So clearly there was some other channel level that I guess Ed Keenholz probably knew because he was minding the gallery that day. So we, as many of us, you know, eight or ten of us, artists, friends, came to be there when the police came. And it was just to observe. We didn't know what was happening. Right, but you showed up with your We family. showed up, the police arrived, they walked through the gallery, they couldn't see anything pornographic. I mean, there were definitely erotic sexual images on display. They looked straight at them and they couldn't see them. Their minds did not grasp what they were seeing. They were black and white photographs. This was in a context, I mean, they're used to, they're probably used to seeing black and white pornography, but in magazines. Right. And they would have recognized a magazine, but they couldn't see Pin the... Pin-up girls or, uh, yeah, or Whatever things. it was. And uh, they were about to leave. And Ed Keenholz bent over and picked up a tiny little piece from one of the, one of the uh, assemblages that was half obscured and said, is this what you're looking for? Which took me, and th in thinking back, it was clear he wanted something to happen. He wanted the arrest to occur. Uh, and I had photographs taken of that, that piece that even looking at it straight on, you wouldn't know what it was because it was obscured. So Wally was arrested, taken, taken away, that, it was just that day. He, got, he was bailed out right away. And when the uh, trial came to, play, came, came to uh, be held, they had a couple of the gallery had a couple of volunteer attorneys who were not criminal attorneys. They were, real estate attorneys, who apparently were art collectors, who volunteered. They didn't go to the, the gallery, did not go to the ACLU, did not call on the cultural community to rally. They did none of the things you do when there's a, a freedom of speech or a censorship case. So, incompetence. Well, you'd also figure that that would have helped in getting exposure or creating a buzz if that was the... If that was the intent. Yeah. The other thing is that somebody just did it out of, the, did it out of meanness to Wally. And there's one art writer who said the art scene at that point could be defined as being split into two movements, one, of, one headed by Ed Keenholz and one headed by Wally Berman. And that it was to Keenholz's advantage to knock down his rival. Well, Wally seemed like such a gentle soul that didn't seem capable of, you know, playing that way. Well, he, did, he, he didn't. I don't think he knew any. Knew right. what, he knew what happened. So, so and, and, and the consequence of he was found guilty because on the basis of the case, this was erotic material. He was found guilty. He was fined. No one had money. Here were two lawyers defending him. No one had any money to pay the fine. It's, you know, you do not go into court uh, on the judgment day and not, you don't, and not have some cash in case. You... So he was taken away again in handcuffs to jail again until Dean Stockwell could raise some cash and bail him out. Absolute incompetence. Which, so there's no really one good explanation of what happened there. But there is some sort of bad faith. And, he, and, 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 and it brutally sat, felt did something to, Wall, to Wally in a way that I don't think he ever expected to have happened to him. He might have he expected, left town after he left, that. He might have been expected to be arrested for pot sometime or any number of semi-dangerous activities, but I don't think he ever expected the art world to do this to him. And he, and he never got over it. So can you look, wait, can we look through some of these? And mm -hmm. This is one of the plain blue detectives uh, leading Wally out of the gallery, this criminal. Um, we're in a different. That, yeah. yeah, that's. that's okay. This this is on the this is on on the trial day. 
between uh, during the lunch break. And there's uh, Walter Hobbs and uh, Wally and Shirley and Dean Stockwell and David Meltzer. And we were like uh, kind of lighthearted. I don't think we knew what we were doing. And, you know, we're kind of a happy-go-lucky bunch of people. Uh, Artie Richer. Right, the mood seems rather light. Well, I mean, and, and Walter there in his suit, uh, like, he was, like he was the adult. <laughs> but the fact, the fact that no one had... Who is this? Uh, Craig Crawford. Oh, Craig, Craig oh it is? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Oh. Now this, this is at the moment the police are arresting Wally. And here's a, there was a feeling of drama because all of a sudden the tide had turned. They were about to leave, and Ed Keenholz said, Is this what you're looking for? And, I, and that is, you know, in my mind, so vivid. Um, all right. And you want to just kind of go through these ones and tell no, us they, who? These are gallery scenes. I don't know who that is with Walter. But it's Walter Hopps. Yes, and this is probably at the uh, Sindel. This is at the Wally show at the Ferris with, uh, I don't remember his name. And that's a picture of Bob Jones, of which you, earlier you asked me. He was somebody who was a close friend of mine, but he wasn't in the gallery scene. Is that Phil Oaks? No, no right? No, that's not. Uh, who was that? I can't remember her name right now. It'll come down. It's not Susie Hick. No. Okay. It's Tommy Diamore. There's a famous Italian restaurant in Hollywood. Demores, and she was the bad seed of that family. Yeah. She was a, a, a gay, masculine girl who had the most beautiful girlfriends. And she, she, the, she was. This is a woman. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh my God! Yeah. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> it's like... and she came by with the most gorgeous girlfriends, and I thought it was wow. like, just marvelous. Anytime she came by. And these, these, are, these are people in that circle. This is Susie Hicks. Uh, uh, Juanita Dixon? No. I'm sorry, my names are, my names are slow. Okay. Lori Fox? Lori Fox, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. right. And who was Lori Fox? Lori Fox was like a, one of the glamour girls. She'd been a Meglin Kitty, one of the children that learned to tap dance. She could, when she was a child, she could tap dance on her head. They gave her a metal thing, a hat with a metal thing, and she could tap dance on top of her head. She went on to do some uh, uh, bit parts in movies, and she was girlfriends of people like Donald O'Connor. And uh, she was alienated, very alienated. She ended up being arrested, and she died in prison in New Mexico of asthma. Really? What was she arrested for? Pop, carrying she, her, she and her inner Jaguar had too much pot. Bad judgment. And who's that? Um, that's Juanita Dixon, one of the girls. One of the girls in the circle. Okay. I'm gonna put these back. Let me take this one. Let's put them back in the right order. And who was Linda Lovely? She's a girl who came from came down from San Francisco for a period of time and I Met her and photographed her. I don't think I ever got to know her very well. Okay. A good photograph. Okay. Just want to make sure I put these back in the right order. And who was this? Her. She adopted the name Dominique. Her name. She does not anyone want. She does not want anyone to know her name. Her real name is Sonia Friedman. <laughs> but she became Dominique, and she's a fashion designer, and she was gorgeous. She's wearing one of her own designs, all knitwear. Um, she's so photogenic. 
and she is uh, he's still she's still around, but she's changed completely. A lot of people change a great deal if they live long enough. Have you ever sought out some of the people that you photographed initially? And I come across them every so often. I haven't sought them out. To, to sometimes, point. sometimes I want to give them photographs. I, if I hear somebody is still uh, still alive. Have you ever re-photographed them later on in life? Sometimes, yes. Like Susie Hicks, I photographed over a great many years of her life. It's the image on top. So at that point, um, Wally went up to Larkspur, correct? Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what what transpired after that? How did did he how did he engage with work and how did? Um, well, I mean, I was out of touch because I was here, but I, I I knew that he continued to produce his issues of Semina, which he had started here and had done three or four here in Los Angeles, which I helped him a great deal in photographic work and. Had done some covers for it. Okay, so Semina was started here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. this was prior to the Ferris Gallery. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Incident. Exactly. Okay. And, and, and at that point, that had been the most uh, self-promoting thing he'd ever done. You know, he produced this little magazine, this little art object series that he printed a hundred, a hundred and fifty at the most of any one. Some of them actually he did leave at bookstores. And, and I'm sure they sold very easily uh, because they were quite original and they were not expensive. That was the most commercial thing that I know that he had ever done. He continued that when he was in Larks Burning. I think he continued doing it even after he came back here. So, Semina, and here we have some early examples, and I think, is this one of the first ones, right? This is Semina. So can you this just kind is, of explain a little bit oh, of what well, it was and okay, how it was okay, organized okay, this, and this, how involved? And this ties in, interestingly enough. Do you want to, which? This way? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this, this is uh, seminar number one, and every, each one was in a different format. This one was in, in a, a plain envelope. He, this is a photograph of his on the cover, and inside were these individual pieces, photographs, poems, collages. This happens to be the piece that got him arrested. Uh, it's a small uh, copy of a, a drawing by Cameron, uh, but in, in the exhibition where at, at the Ferris Gallery, it was covered like this. So if you looked at it, you wouldn't know that it was anything controversial. And this is what, what Ed said, is this what you're looking for to the police? Also and, what's so and, ironic, and, it's not and, even his own image, it's somebody, another artist. But he's image. exhibiting, you know, a piece of pornography. Well. But not, but you know, and they could recognize this. Uh, but in this, in, he, had, he, had, he uh, included poetry that he liked. Uh, this is a Walter Hopps photograph, I believe, signed. And then individual poems from different sources. This is one of my photographs. And, uh, and so did he come to you and he was saying, I'm putting together this magazine, will you, he would, you have he, an image in mind? Did he, you? He, would, he would say, can I use this piece? I like this. And then I did dark room. Like I would make the prints. We'd, we, Wally would come in, we'd, spend up, we'd stay up all night, and I'd make a hundred prints like this. And we'd stay with them, and we'd, we'd wash them, and we'd dry them. And then he'd, next day he'd come by and pick them up. So, uh, and uh, 